All right, thanks for joining us this morning. We're going to continue on in our class with Hebrews. Specifically, we're going to be looking at chapter 7 this morning. So if you would, let's get your Bibles. Go ahead and be turning to Hebrews chapter 7. We have a lot of material to cover this morning, and so I hope that you're wide awake. I hope that you're ready to go. If you have a pen, I'm going to ask you to be underlining and marking a few things in your Bibles. So please make sure you have your Bibles and your pens, and we'll get going in just a second. I'll give you a, a moment to grab those. Uh, as we are looking at Hebrews chapter 7, I want us to recap the other chapters that we have covered so far. Uh, Anthony and Adam have both done a great job. I love the book of Hebrews and I've fallen in love with it again. And so uh, this morning there's a few things that I want to pull out from chapter 7 that is going to be pertinent to us. That's going to be important, especially with other teachings in the religious realm. Um, I want us to talk about the Melchizedekian priesthood. I want us to talk about the Levitical priesthood. And those are big subjects. So we could make a whole series, I believe, out of this. But we're going to try and cover it this morning. So bear with me, stay with me, um, and we'll get going. Uh, you got your Bibles, Hebrews chapter 7. Uh, really quick, a recap if you're taking notes. I jotted down the other chapters, basically the main thoughts from each chapter. In, in chapter 1 of Hebrews, it starts off, and God has spoken to us through His Son. That's where we have the words that we have in our Bibles today. God has spoken to us through His Son, and He has all authority to do so. He has a more excellent name than the angels, and we think about how wonderful and how great angels are, but Jesus has a name above everything. He is greater than the angels. He is God, and God has given him the authority to speak to us today through his words, the Bible. Chapter 2, we come, and it talks about how Christ is the one who brings us salvation. We have something that has been brought to us. Uh, we can be saved from our sins. We can have spiritual cleansing. But Christ brought salvation, and in doing so, he brought many sons to glory. Chapter 3 is going to be compared with the faithfulness of Christ, with the faithfulness of Moses. And we see how Moses was faithful in leading Israel, and how he was faithful to God in, in leading them out of Egypt, and to leading them in the wilderness wanderings. But we have Jesus Christ who's going to be faithful to God. The encouragement is given for us also to be faithful and to not harden our hearts and to not be rebellious like the people of Israel. We come to chapter 4. We have the promise of rest uh, is for those who remain faithful to God. Remember that we are working here in this life. We're toiling. We are trying to do all that we can to be faithful servants of Jesus Christ and of God but with the promise and the reminder that we have something better waiting for us. We have a rest that is being prepared. And we're going to, we can allude to that in many different verses throughout the New Testament. That we are going to have a rest, a reward, something that is being prepared for us if we remain faithful to God. Also, he reminds us of our high priest that is going to be Jesus Christ. Our high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses. He was tempted in every point, as we are today, but yet he was different because he was one who had no sin. He never had a flaw within him. He never had a blemish. He never wronged God. He never committed sin, but yet we fall subject to that, don't we? Hebrews chapter 5, we see the qualifications of the priesthood, and Adam touched base with us on that class with the thought of Melchizedek. We're going to talk about him today and get more in depth with Melchizedek and his priesthood, but also the Levitical priesthood, as I mentioned earlier. And then we're going to con con come in contact with this phrase of the order of Melchizedek. The order of Melchizedek. That's going to be a phrase that I'm going to ask you to underline in just a moment. But we see this in chapter 5 of Hebrews. In chapter 6, it's going to pick up after we've talked about in chapter 5 how they're needing to, uh, they need the milk of the word. Uh, they're not needing the meat at this juncture, although they should, they're still needing the, meat, the milk of the word. Hebrews chapter 6 picks up and says, Therefore, uh, because of the priesthood that was just discussed in chapter 5, uh, because they still need milk and not solid food, um, what we're looking at is they want us to move on to perfection. Don't, uh, don't stay in the elementary principles. Don't, don't just stay in the basics of what you know. He's saying we need to move on. Leave the theology of repentance from dead works. Move on from the theology of faith and baptisms and laying on of hands and resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. 
It kind of makes me think for a moment. If he's considering those elementary principles, where am I in my faith? What do I need to shore up? What do I need to study on? Well, those things exactly. So let's go back to the milk of the word and understand some of these basic principles that he's trying to lay out for us and the greatness that Christ brings in the New, New Testament and what we have to look forward to and what we're trying to grow in our spiritual lives. And so the writer here in Hebrews is going to end chapter 6 with God reassuring us of his infallible purpose in Christ. Christ had a specific purpose of why he came to this earth. And we're going to see that God's infallible purpose in Christ is going to be accomplished. I want to start chapter 7 by reading the end of chapter 6. Read with me chapter 6, verse 19 and 20, because it's going to introduce us into the thought process of chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. This hope we have as an anchor for the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest according forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Verse 19 talks about this hope. The hope that the promises that they're going to be inherited through the faith he's talked about, verse 12. The hope that we have of the blessings God has promised to Abraham and through his seed, all nations of the earth will be blessed, verse 13. We're going to see this hope is referred to as God is faithful and he's not able to lie. He's going to be trustworthy and reliable, verse 18. This hope refers back to the refuge that is set before us, verse 18 again. And the hope that we have that Jesus is our high priest continually, verse 20. Here's what we know. Dealing with this thought process of the high priest going behind the veil, what he's meaning is he's coming before the presence of Almighty God. We'll look at that in just a moment. But we know that when the high priest entered the presence behind the veil, he was coming before God because that's where God chose to put his name. The high priest is going to be the mediator, the one who goes a go-between from God to man or from man to God. He's the mediator, the go-between to bring God our supplications and our prayers, to help him and say, God, I understand. I was there. I was part of that. I understand the sinful uh, acts that they're, they're tempted by. I, I understand their hurt, their pain, because I was involved in it. I was hurt. I suffered pain. I went through all these difficult situations. I understand what they feel like. He was the one who's going to make atonement for our sins. So we go back to this thought of priesthood in just a little bit. We're going to come to that in verse 11. But I want you to notice the last three words of chapter 6 and verse 20. It says, Order of Melchizedek. This phrase is used seven times in the entire Bible. Order of Melchizedek. What in the world does he mean? What is he talking about here? Here's where I want you to grab your pen or your highlighter. I want you to mark with me, and you can go back after this class. But I want you to write these down and mark them. There are two places outside of Hebrews that mentions, order, or mentions Melchizedek. But then Hebrews is going to mention the order of Melchizedek as, long as, as well as Psalms uh, 110, verse 4. Here's the places that are mentioned to the order of Melchizedek. Psalm 110, verse 4. Turn over there and underline that portion in your Bible. Psalm 110, verse 4. It says, you are a priest forever. And this is in reference to Christ. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. That's going to be the passage outside of Hebrews that talks about the order of Melchizedek, where this phrase is used. The rest of the time, I, I misspoke earlier. Uh, the rest of the time, it's mentioned in Psalm 110, and the rest of the time this phrase, order of Melchizedek, is only found in the book of Hebrews. So go with me and we're going to underline or circle the passage of where it says order of Melchizedek. In Hebrews chapter 5, and verse 6, two chapters prior to chapter 7, he's going to be quoting from Psalm 110 and verse 4 that we just marked. 
He's going to be quoting that Old Testament passage here in chapter 5 and verse 6. That Jesus is referred to as the priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. We also want to ask you to mark chapter 5 and verse 10. Another place where it talks about the order of Melchizedek. Chapter 5 and verse 10. Then turn over to chapter 6 and verse 20. It's going to make the reference here to the order of Melchizedek. Then we're going to find three times in chapter 7 where we're located today. Chapter 7, verse 11. Chapter 7, verse 17. And chapter 7 and verse 20. All refer to the order of Melchizedek. So what about this Melchizedek? Try saying that five times real fast. First of all, you'll feel sorry for me here in a second when I say it so many times. But what about Melchizedek? Outside of Hebrews, and outside the passage that we just marked in Psalm 110, he's only mentioned one other time in Scripture. And that's in Genesis chapter 14 and verse 18, as we saw two weeks ago with Brother Adam as he referred to Melchizedek. What we know here about Melchizedek is, goes back to the time of Abraham. Abraham and his nephew Lot come and they're fixing to part ways. They're going over to decide which part of the land that they want. Well, Lot is going to take uh, and settle in the plains of the Jordan as far as Sodom. And you may recognize that name, Sodom and Gomorrah. God's going to destroy those cities later for their wickedness. But at this time, Lot uh, sees that the land is fertile. He takes, the, he takes the area of the plain of Jordan and then he pitches his tents near Sodom. We find that in Genesis chapter 13 and verse 12. We're going to have some kings, and I will let you refer to those in chapter 13 and 14 that are going to basically come to war against one another. And remember that these kings are going to war against Sodom, Gomorrah, Adamah, Zeboim, and Zor, or another word for that is Bilah. And so these kings are going to come and try to overthrow these other kings. And when they do, they're going to take Lot captive and take them back with them. Abraham gets wind of this, that he's going, he lost his, his nephew uh, to these other kings. He's been taken captive along with the people. They've plundered their goods and taken their possessions. And so Abraham arms 318 of his servants, his trained servants. And he's going to go by night and overtake the armies. And he's going to bring back his nephew, his people, and their possessions and goods. Well, when he comes back from defeating these kings, there's a man that's going to come out to him. His name is Melchizedek. That's, our, that's the man in, in, in we're talking about today. Genesis chapter 14 and verse 18 says this, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, for he was the priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he, talking about Abraham, gave him, talking about Melchizedek, a tithe of all. And that's the history lesson that we have about Melchizedek. Those verses in regards to the Melchizedek and the priesthood. So what do we take from this when we look at Hebrews chapter 7? Well, let us understand a few things of what we do know about Melchizedek to help us understand Hebrews chapter 7. This is kind of a history lesson, but sets us up for the understanding of what's going to come with Christ. So in Genesis chapter 14 and verse 8, we know this. Melchizedek, his name means king of righteousness or the righteous king. Melek, which means king in Hebrew, and Zedek, which means righteous in Hebrew, you put those together, that's where his name is derived from, king of righteousness. We also learn from verse 18 of Genesis 14 that he's going to be the king of Salem. And this word in Hebrew is going to refer to being peace. So he's referred to the king of righteousness, but also known as the king of Salem, which is the king of peace. So I'm going to reference this word back to Jerusalem also Jerusalem. And so it's going to be referred to Jerusalem. The, uh, um, um, Salem is going to be referred to or known maybe as Jerusalem. Or another word for term for this is Zion. We see this in Psalm chapter 76 and verse 2. 
And so we see that Melchizedek is the righteous king. He is the king of peace. And just saying that already, I'm going to, you're going to see the connection that we're going to see with Christ. We talked about a few weeks ago in a lesson when Christ is going to enter in Matthew chapter 17, Matthew chapter 17, the triumphal entry. He's going to be seen as the king of peace. We're already making that connection. We've also been referred to as Christ as the king of righteousness. Once again, these are the terms Melchizedek is known by as well. We see in Genesis chapter 14 and verse 18 that Melchizedek is also a priest. Which is usually, this is unusual because usually the priests do not serve as kings, nor the kings serve as priests. They're usually two separate roles. But here we see that he is both priest and king. He is the priest of the Most High God. We know this to be Jehovah God because of the, the, the descriptions that are given to us. You see, there are other gods that people could have been serving at the times. Foreign gods, pagan gods, false gods. But he is a priest of the Most High God. He is the priest of creator of heaven and earth. He is priest of Jehovah. And that's basically all we know about him. We also know that he is greater than Abraham. Why do we know this? He is considered in his status a greater person than Abraham because Abraham is going to give a tithe of all he had to Melchizedek. And then Melchizedek is going to give a blessing. We see a greater that's going to be blessing a lesser. He's going to be giving him a blessing on his victory and a blessing to God who is over the earth, creator of heavens and earth. So we see this description of Melchizedek in Genesis chapter 14 and verse 18. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of peace. He is also a priest of the most high God. And we're going to see that he's going to be given a tithe by Abraham, showing that he is greater in, in the position that he is at, uh, given to him by God. I'm going to jump ahead to Psalm chapter 110 and verse 4 to see the next thing that we know about Melchizedek that's not mentioned in Genesis. The thought there, he says, that is rendered, it says he is a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. This is a prophecy in regards to Christ, the coming Messiah. He's going to talk about his priesthood, but how he's going to be a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And he's going to be a priest forever. Now, this forever word may jumble us up just a little bit. What is this word forever? Is he still priest today? Is he reigning with Christ as priest? Is he still a high priest? Is he, uh, what, is this, what does this terminology mean? Well, forever means perpetually. It's never ending. And that's what we would think about, right? Uh, forever is for an eternity. Well, the wording that's used here is used to have the thought that it's going to be for that time period that it possesses. Uh, throughout the time period that the term is going to be applied. For instance, the Romans are going to use a term that's going to be mentioned like this. The dictator perpetus. Best I can explain. Which was an honorable title given to Caesar. Uh, meaning that he's going to be a dictator, the ruler, uh, perpetuous, uh, perpetuous, uh, perpetual, the thought of forever. But yet they understood that Caesar's not going to have to be a king forever. He's not going to rule forever. They understand he's going, his life is going to end. He's going to die. But this was a, time that, uh, a term that was used during the time of his reign. He's, he's going to reign forever during his, his term. And so it meant that he was going to be able to reign uh, not live forever, but reign forever uh, during his rule until his rule or reign was over. This thought of forever, the term at which the time frame is applied. The order of Melchizedek, let's look at that for a moment. The order of Melchizedek simply means the arrangement given to him. It, it is, is of similar arrangement or in the like nature or just as Melchizedek. So when Christ is going to become priest... When he's going to become our high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, he's going to become priest just as Melchizedek came priest. And we're going to explain that a little bit more here momentarily. I want us to jump ahead now to Hebrews chapter 7, coming back to our text for this morning's class. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 3 talks about how Melchizedek was without father and mother. He was without genealogy. Neither beginning of days nor end of life. 
like the Son of God, and he's a priest continually. Those are the things that we draw from Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 3. What we need to understand here is that this does not mean he doesn't have a father or mother. It doesn't mean that he doesn't have a total a background at all. What this means is that without father or mother, there's simply there are no records that are given of his lineage, of his genealogy. And so it was said, usually Jews would refer to those whose parents weren't, were unknown or they weren't recorded. They would refer to them as found without genealogy. Or they would just say, he has no father. Why? Because there was no genealogy record of him. Well, we do not have a genealogy record of Melchizedek. Because he kind of comes onto the scene and then he just kind of leaves the scene. This is not Christ incarnate. This is, this is a man who is actually a king and a priest there in Salem. I believe he's a physical man. Uh, but it's, 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 it's showing uh, the precursor of what Christ is going to be in similarities to. It was also said that a rabbi would say that a converted Gentile that's going to come over to the Jewish traditions and faith, that a converted Gentile had no father. Why? Because they had no record or genealogies as the Jews would have kept. You remember the song, and this would be for the younger ones. There's a song that we sometimes sing in VBS or maybe a church camp. It goes, Father Abraham had many sons. And we would do our arms like this, and it's one of those get up and turn around songs and sit down. But Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham. You see, what the Jewish people did is they traced their lineage back, basically starting to Father Abraham. And they would kept good records of the lineage and who was father and who begot who and who was each other's son. And this was going to be important when we come to the Levitical priesthood about how they functioned and how they served. So Melchizedek is said to have no father, no mother, no genealogy simply because we don't know who they are. There was no records that we have that are tangible that were kept. But we know that he was instituted and given as a priest by God because he's going to be functioning in that capacity as the Bible tells us. And then we see this making connection with Christ Christ is not going to come necessarily from a whole lineage. We, we know his genealogy, but he's going to be given to us by God. Um, he was appointed our high priest, not by man, but he's going to be appointed high priest by the authority of God, not because of his physical lineage, according to Christ here. And so we're kind of coupling the two now a little bit, but still, Melchizedek, what do we know about him? He's king of Salem. He's king of peace. He is also our our priest, or he's also the priest of Salem. He is going to be given a tithe to Abraham, which shows that he is a greater, that he's going to bless Abraham. We see that he has no genealogy. He's not, he has no father, no mother, not literally, but he doesn't have a record of those. Um, he's going to be appointed by God, by his authority at that time and that place, which also shows us that there are other people who feared God and understood and knew about God other than Abraham at this juncture. We also know that Christ is going to come as a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, or just as Melchizedek came. He's going to be appointed to the place, to the position, by God and his authority. Now in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 11, we see the next place that it talks about according to the order of Melchizedek. Another uh, little thought process here. We know that Melchizedek was not called according to the order of Aaron. We're going to visit that in verse 11 in just a moment. In chapter 7 and verse 17, we see that he's going to be a priest forever. That has already been mentioned. And he's also going to say the same thing in chapter 7 and verse 20. So we are very limited in our knowledge to understand more fully the thought and what all Melchizedek did. But we have enough knowledge that we can understand what Christ is going to come in the order of Melchizedek or similar to how Melchizedek came on the scene. Christ is going to arrive by the authority and by the power of God. He's going to take the place and serve as our high priest. He's going to take the place and serve as our king. And I hope that you see the similarities already there. But I want us to go to Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 11. This is going to be the next juncture that we, we, we jump into. It says, Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? All right. Now, what in the world are we talking about with this Levitical priesthood? 
Once again, I'm going to try to condense this down for us just a little bit to help us understand the Levitical priesthood because we could spend a lot of time on it. Because God spends a lot of time on the Levitical priesthood. We see the Levitical priesthood coming to effect in Exodus chapter 28 where God gives Moses the instructions to set up the tabernacle and all of its furnishings inside. And he also gives the instructions on how to install the priest and the high priest and their functions, their duties, what they're supposed to do. And we're going to see that in Exodus, he gives instructions in Leviticus, he gives instructions in Numbers, and he gives us instructions in Deuteronomy. So I would encourage you, on your own time, to go read and to couple all those books together to fully understand the Levitical priesthood, but here it is in a nutshell. The Levitical priesthood was appointed by God through Moses to be the people who are going to be from the tribe of Levi. Remember, you have Abraham. Then you have his son Isaac, who's going to have a son named Jacob. And then Jacob is going to have 12 sons, referred to as the 12 sons of Israel, because Jacob's name has been changed to Israel now. So he has 12 sons, and they're going to be known as the 12 sons or the 12 tribes of Israel. One of those tribes that we know is Levi. Levi is going to be the tribe from which the priest are going to come from in order to minister or to serve God. Now, God is going to give instructions on the tabernacle. That is going to be the meeting place for where people are to come to offer the sacrifices and the priests are going to do their priestly duties at the tabernacle. He gives those instructions also in Exodus chapter 28 and following. We see here that the tabernacle is the place where God chooses to put his name. That's where he's going to be with his people. That's where his presence is going to reside. And if you recall, I would encourage you to go look up a picture on, uh, on Google or, or somewhere on the internet to find the, a, a layout of the tabernacle. But you're going to have the outside surrounding borders, and then you're going to have basically the tent of meeting. All right? You're going to have the tent of the tabernacle that's going to be inside those, the, the parameters. You're going to have an a, a, a altar that they're going to be sacrificing on outside the tabernacle. And then you're going to have a wash basin, basically a laver, that they're going to come and the priests are going to be able to do their washings. So washing is going to be familiar to them. And then they're going to be able to go in and do their priestly duties. Uh, they're going to be the ones to set up the show table of showbread in, in the holy place. And then you have uh, the, the, the menorah or the seven candlesticks, we might refer to them as. And you're going to have the altar of incense. And then there's this curtain. And this was going to be a... a very large curtain, by the way. You remember when, when Christ died, it talks about the veil is going to be torn in two from top to bottom. And I think there's a lot of significance to that. We could talk about that later. But, but the veil is going to separate the holy place from the holy of holies, or the most holy place. And behind the veil is where the Ark of the Covenant that God instructed them to build is going to be. And that's where you have the cherubim on either side of the Ark and their wings are extended and they're almost touching in the center. And it's right there that is the mercy seat of God in the Holy of Holies on top of the Ark of the Covenant, known as the Shekinah. And that's where God's glory is going to reside or he's going to, his presence is going to be. And it was that this veil is going to separate the holy from the most holy or the holy of holies. That veil, I'm going to throw this in as two bits real quick, but that veil is going to be massive as I already mentioned to make that separation, that distinction, because the priest could come in, but only the, the, the priest could come into the holy place. But only the high priest could go behind the veil to enter to the presence of God to offer sacrifice or atonement for people one time a year. That veil is going to be woven together and it's said to be about four inches thick. Think about how heavy that is. That's bigger than any rug I have at my house. Any curtain that we put on our windows. A veil that is four inches thick. One, one article I read or, or, or uh, yeah, one article I read said that, that if you even strapped the, the bottom of it and tied it to two horses and had the horses trying to pull that, uh, that curtain apart or that veil apart, it, it couldn't be done. It was so strong. You think about that uh, when Christ dies and it tears in two. So you have the veil. You have the veil. I'll get back on topic here. You have the veil. And one time a year, the high priest. And once again, the high priest is going to be Aaron. at the first. He's the first high priest. And then it goes down the lineage of Aaron. You have to be from the family of Aaron in order to, to succeed and to be as high priest. It was a hereditary thing. 
He had to be from the tribe of Levi to be a priest, but in order to be high priest, he had to be from the tribe of Levi, and he had to be from the family of Aaron. Let me find where we are on my notes, because I got off track for a second. So the Levitical priesthood was set up as, as a way that the people could come, and the Levites are going to perform ministerial duties and worship to our God. And that's how the construct was set up for the Levitical priesthood. That's going to be important when we come to Christ being our high priest in just a moment because we need to understand the Old Testament and the process that worked there of the Levitical priesthood. The um, priest had different duties, especially in moving and transporting the tabernacle. Some of them had to uh, transport the tabernacle covers, the curtains and the screens, the cords. That was, that was going to be one of the section of the priest's duties, the, the Gershonites. Uh, then you have the Kohathites who are going to, to be able to, their, their duties were to carry the Ark of the Covenant and the, the lampstands and the altars and the utensils. And they had to move all those things with poles. Um, then you have the, the Marites that are going to move the, the boards and the sockets and the pillars and the bars. And they had to carry all those things by hand. So you had the Levitical priesthood that had their roles, their function, their duties in order to minister before God. Once again, only the high priest could come before God, to come into the Holy of Holies, before the Shekinah, or the glory of God, where God's mercy seat is going to reside to offer atonement for the people. Then I want you to go, that was verse 11, basically. If there is imperfection with the Levitical priesthood, why is there a need for a new priest? Well, because there was imperfection with the priesthood. One, because you had a man who was able to commit sin, who was going to present himself before God, who made atonement for the people, but that was going to be, they had to do that every year as a repeating occurrence because there was always sin in the camp. Where Christ is going to come, he's going to be the perfect, unblemished, uh, sinless sacrifice, who's going to be able to go behind the veil, as we read earlier in, in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19 and following. He's going to be able to go behind the presence into the presence of the veil, Come before God. He's going to be our mediator, our intercessor. I'm jumping ahead of myself. We'll see that in just a moment. Then verse 12. Verse 12. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 12. We have seen who Melchizedek is and, and how Christ is going to succeed him and come like or just as Melchizedek came on board. By the authority of God, he's going to be instituted and put into place. Um, the Levitical priesthood um, was, was imperfect and therefore we needed a new high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, who was not in the order of Aaron. Well, why? Because Melchizedek came before the Levitical priesthood. Christ is going to come, but he's not going to be from the lineage of, of Levi, as we know. He's going to be from the lineage of Judah. And we're going to read about that in verse 13 and 14 in just a moment. Verse 12 says this, For the priesthood being changed. Why? Because now we have, we're being done away with the Levitical priesthood, and Christ is taking over as the high priest. So there's a change in the priesthood. We live under the New Testament, the New Covenant, under the authority of Christ. He serves as our high priest, our intercessor, our mediator between us and God. The priesthood being changed, of necessity, there is also a change of the law. Well, Anthony's doing a great job on Wednesday nights of dealing with the topic of the greatest sermon ever preached. What's the difference in the sermon being preached then in the Old Testament? In the Old Testament, they go about the old law. But with, since the old law is being done away with and the Levitical system is being done away with, we have a new high priest, Jesus, and we have a new law, that being Christ's law. If you remember in some of the things that we're talking about on Wednesday night in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, 6, and 7, it may say, you've heard it said of old. Well, what's it talking about? You've heard it said of the old scriptures, of the old covenant, of the Old Testament. A lot of times in reference to the Ten Commandments or something said by one of the prophets. You've heard it said of old. But then Jesus comes back and he says, but I say to you. Well, there's a change in the priesthood, that being Christ. There's also a change in the law. No longer do we live under the old law, although it brought us as a tutor unto Christ to know what God expects from us, to know how to be obedient to him to know how much he loves us, to know how to love him back, to know what he expects from us. It brought us to Christ, but now there's a change in the law as well. No longer do we live under the old covenant, but we live under Christ's law in the new covenant. That's why we're in the New Testament right now. We're living under the new law. And so for the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. 
Now, verse 13, read with that with me. Verse 13 and 14. For he, I believe that's speaking of Christ, of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe. Well, once again, he's not from the tribe of Levi, as was custom for the Levitical priesthood, for the Arianic priesthood. There is, he's from a different tribe. How does this work? Which, from which no man is officiated at the altar. Why? Because all of them came from the Levit Levitical priesthood. Verse 14. For it is evident that our Lord arose from who? In your text it says from the tribe of Judah, who's going to be another son of Israel, one of the twelve tribes. The tribe of Judah is pr primarily going to, is going to be known as the kingly tribe. It's going to produce the kings. We have David, and then all the way the genealogy goes to Christ. And so we see here, it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood. What does this mean? There is a whole other lesson within this passage right here. You see, when God institutes the priesthood in the Old Testament, in Exodus chapter 28, and Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, we see all these, these things that he sets up for us. He never said... Um, Reuben couldn't do it, Asher couldn't do it, um, Benjamin couldn't do it, Joseph or Ephraim couldn't do it. But specifically, he's very specific in who he wants to minister before him. He specifically said the Levites. In this verse, this is a side note if you want to jot this down. In this verse, we see the law of exclusion or the law of silence being applied. Very clear as we look and we see, why do we do the things we do in, in, in our worship, in our lives? Why, when we're following God, we have patterns that we're trying to follow. Well, why do we do some of those things? Same reason they did in the Old Testament. God said that he wanted the Levites to be the priest that minister before him. Which means that it ruled out everybody else. Every other tribe that may say, uh, the, the, the men of Reuben may have said, well, you know what, I want to be a priest to God. I want to serve him. And that's a great ambition. That's what you ought to want to do. But God said, I want just the Levites. Which excluded every other tribe that may have wanted to serve God. God just wanted the Levites. It was reserved just for them. The law of exclusion. I would liken it to this. If you were to go and to order pizza online, or to call in to them and say, I want a pepperoni pizza. That's great. And, and you get to, they, they, they deliver it to your house and they bring it to your door and they knock on the door, you answer it, and they tell you that's going to be uh, whatever amount that it was going to be. They open up the pizza and you look at it and you say, well, that's not what I ordered. And they said, you said you wanted a pepperoni pizza, correct, sir? And you're going to reply, well, yes, I, I was very specific in what I wanted. I, I wanted a pepperoni pizza. Well, the law of exclusion applies when a specific is given. Now, stay with me for just a moment. Because when you opened up that pizza, what you saw was pepperonis, which is what you asked for. But you also saw bell peppers. You also saw black olives. You also saw bacon and hamburger and ham and onions and anchovies. Let me ask you. Are you going to be pleased with that pizza? Are you going to pay for that pizza? If you're anything like me, I'm going to say no. I, that's not what I ordered. But why? Because I was very specific in what I asked for. When I go and I order something, I tell you what I want, which means I don't want anything else that is not mentioned, or that, that may be on the menu. I don't want anything else. I've given you what I've asked for. And so the concept here, we see Jesus has arised from the tribe of Judah, of which Moses spoke nothing about, God spoke nothing about the tribe of Judah. Why? Because the, the priests were not supposed to come from the tribe of Judah. They're only supposed to come from the tribe of Levi. Now, I'm going to take a pause for just a moment. And I'm going to insert a thought just to keep with this law of silence or why we do what we do. In the churches of Christ, many times visitors have come in and they ask, well, why do you not use instruments? Why, why, do, you, why do you not do that? Well, because of the law of exclusion. Because they were offered, and God wanted them in the Old Testament. He asked them to set up stringed instruments and set up lyres and flutes and all these other things. Second Chronicles chapter 25, chapter 29, when Hezekiah restores temple worship. God asked for those things, and so therefore give him those things. But in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, Christ being our high priest, God tells us with the new law, here's what I want. 
I want you to sing with the Spirit and the understanding. I want you to sing with grace, and I want you to sing with melody in your hearts to the Lord. That's, that's one of the reasons that I don't use instruments in my worship to my God. Because he specifically told me, here's what I want. I want singing. I want your voice, and I want your heart. Therefore, it excludes everything else, just as it would in the Levitical priesthood. And when he specifies Levites, that excludes all the other tribes. When I specify I want a pepperoni pizza, I want just the pepperoni pizza and none of the other things that you think you may want to put on there. When God says, I want your hearts and your voice, that's what I want to give to him. And I want to give everything else to the side and not give that to him because it doesn't matter if I think he'll be pleased with it or not. I want to give him what he's asked for. Law of exclusion. Okay, now I want to come back. I've, I've kind of chased a rabbit. I tend to do that sometimes. I want to come back and I want us to continue to press on. We're planning to finish out this chapter eventually. Uh, maybe like Paul and preach till midnight, but we'll get through it. Please don't fall out of a window. Um, that could be detrimental to your health. All right, so uh, verse 14. Uh, it is evident our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. Why? Because once again, only the priests that God ordained were to come from the tribe of Levi. Except now we have Christ, verse 15, and it is far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest. Why? Because Melchizedek didn't have genealogies in the lineage of the, of the Arianic priesthood. Rather, God appointed him by himself in order to do the, the ministerial duties. Here, God has appointed Christ, and since Christ of no uh, Arianic lineage, uh, Levi, uh, Levitical lineage, in order to be our high priest. Verse 16, Christ who has come not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, uh, the law of Moses or what is given or what the, what the tribes have given, he has not come according to the law of fleshly commandment, but according to what? Notice, the power of an endless life. For he testifies, verse 17, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, we don't know what happened to Melchizedek, if he was taken up, if he physically died and perished, or what, what we don't have knowledge of that from the Bible text. But here's what we do know about Christ. As Melchizedek came and he's going to be king of peace, he's going to be king of righteousness, Christ is going to be given, not according to fleshly commandments, but ordained and given by the authority of God to come and to be our priest. Uh, with no lineage, he doesn't have to be from the tribe of Aaron, or excuse me, tribe of Levi, or from the family of Aaron, but he's going to be given the authority by God. And he's going to come and he's going to what? Have an endless reign. Christ is reigning right now. He lives forever. He is going to live forever, perpetually, continually. There's no beginning nor end to him. And so what we see here is he's going to be a priest forever, according to Melchizedek. Once again, he's taking the Levitical priesthood, and that is being done away with. And now we have Christ. And the Christian thought process. And Christ is our high priest. He's able to go before God. He was able to give himself as a sacrifice on behalf of us. Verse 18. For on the one hand there is an annulling of the former commandment. Because of its weakness and unprofitableness. For the law made nothing perfect. Once again. The law made nothing perfect. It was, not, it, was, it was here to serve a purpose until we came to the time of Christ. And then there is the bringing of a better hope, verse 18, through which we draw near to God. Well, what do you think he's talking about? What is our better hope? I believe he's talking about Christ and his promises and what he's done for us. We have a better hope, and now we're able to draw near to God ourselves as priests. All right, that's a, that's a mind blown, right? Uh, we're able to draw near to God as priests because we are the priesthood of God here now. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 is going to refer to us as a royal priesthood. Uh, we are that spiritual speaking. We are a priesthood unto God and Christ reigns as our high priest. We're going to continue on. Verse 20. Inasmuch as he was not made a priest without an oath. For God said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to our phrase, the order of Melchizedek. Verse 22. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. You see, the first covenant had some fault. 
And it was because of our sins. It was because of our transgressions. It was because of our relationship we did not keep with God. There, there was imperfect in that way. But because we messed up, Christ is going to bring us surety, an assurance for ourselves, for our souls, and our hope that we have. And he's going to bring a better covenant, the covenant that he's going to install, the covenant that he is Lord over, the one that he promises and is faithful to deliver to us. Verse 23, why? It says also, there were many priests. We go down to the Old Testament and we can see different priests and high priests that are going to reign and they're going to, have to, they're going to die off and another one will take its position and then they'll die and then another one will take his position. And they keep going. There have been many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. Right? There is a physical limitation on them. They have so many years of their life God's given to them on this earth and then they're going to die. And once they die, they can't function as high priest anymore because they're dead. That's where Christ is going to come in with a better covenant and a better hope because he is a high priest continually. Notice what it says, verse 23. But he, Jesus, because he continues how long? Because he continues forever. And remember we talked about that term forever a while ago about being applied to the time frame that they serve. For instance, Caesar was going to be Caesar forever, but he's only going to be by that mean the term that was the, the, the term that was applied to him. Uh, he was only going to be king and, and rule, and he was only going to reign as long as he was alive. But what do we know about Christ? Caesars died, prophets died, high priests have died. What do we know about Christ? He's going to rule, and he's going to reign, and his term will be forever, or as long as he lives. And guess what? Christ will live continually, is what he's telling us here. Because he continues forever, he has an unchangeable priesthood. There's nothing that's going to be altered with that. He's going to remain high priest, and we're going to remain as part of the priesthood, and that's going to be in place forever from this point in Hebrews forward, or from the point when he dies on the cross and institutes him as a high priest, is what the Hebrew writer is referring to. Verse 25, Therefore, because he is our high priest, because he lives forever, because he has taken away the old and he's installed the new, Therefore, he is able to save the uttermost, those who come to God through him, since he always or perpetually or forever lives to make intercession for them. Whew. What a thought. What, what a relief that we know that we serve a God and we serve a high priest, that we serve a king who lives and he's always willing to intercede on our behalf on my behalf, because we sin. We fall short. We need help. And he's always there able to do that. Now let's finish out with verse 26 and following. For such a high priest, that being Jesus Christ, for such a high priest was fitting for us. Who is, and here's the descriptive words, for this high priest. Remember, Levitical priesthood, they, had, they, they were not always holy. They had to offer sacrifices for their sin before they could go offer sacrifices for the people's sin, before they could come before the presence of God. Here, this high priest, Jesus Christ, was fitting for us. Why? Because he is holy. He is harmless. He is undefiled. He is separate from sinners and has become higher than the heavens, verse 27, who does not need daily as those high priests of the Old Testament, of those high priests of the Levitical priesthood, to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. For, he died, for, for this he did once for all when he offered up himself. You see, he didn't have to continually offer sacrifices because he was not always sinful. He was sinless. So he offered himself once for all, and that sacrifice was good, one time for all time's sake for us. Verse 28 ends up and says, For the law appoints as high priest men who have weaknesses. But the word of the oath, coming from God and his authority, which came after the law, appoints the Son, Jesus Christ, who has been perfected forever. We have covered a lot of ground today, so I hope that you will mull on this. I hope that you will think about these things. I hope that you will go back and you will study and make more of the connections because it's fascinating. The, the more I read, the more I learn about this, the more connections you see between Melchizedek and Christ. He's going to be a, a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. What we know about Melchizedek, once again, a review. Melchizedek 
was known as the king of righteousness. Christ is known as the king of righteousness. Melchizedek was known as the king of peace. Of Christ, we see the people recognizing him in his triumphal entry as the king of peace, shouting out, Hosanna, meaning save us, I pray. We see Melchizedek, he's serving as a priest unto the Most High God. Well, here, and says, so just like Melchizedek did, Christ is coming and he's replacing the Levitical priesthood. He's replacing that with himself being our high priest, being able to intercede for us forever before the throne of God. We see Melchizedek not having mother nor father nor genealogy. He didn't have a, a historical lineage that we can go back to, a record that we go and we account for, saying, yep, he can be a priest. He was ordained or given the authority by God. Here, we're not tracing Christ back to the Levites. Remember, he comes from the tribe of Judah, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 14. But yet we have him coming as high priest, just like Melchizedek, without the genealogy to support that, the lineage going back to the priesthood. But yet rather, we have him appointed by God. And doing the things. We have Melchizedek being a priest forever. Once again, the Bible doesn't state if he dies or if he's going to, uh, he's going to live on. And God's going to take him up in a whirlwind or anything like that. We don't know. But he's going to remain as a priest as long as he's there in that, in that time frame at his juncture. Serving as priest until something, something happens to him. Christ is going to serve as our high priest for the time allotted to him. Until he's no longer. But guess what Hebrew writer reminds us of? Christ lives continually. He lives forever. And he will actually be our high priest forever. Until he returns again. And we're with him in heaven. Wow. Hebrews is such a rich book. There's so many lessons. But what it helps us to do. It helps us connect the Old Testament with the New. And helps us to understand Christ better. We can't really understand Christ until we understand the Old. Which brings us to the point, you remember the Old Testament is our tutor, Galatians chapter 5, verse 24. It is our tutor to help us understand and learn more about God and bring us to the point to where we have Christ, the Messiah, our King, our High Priest, our Savior, our Redeemer, and what that means. I hope this class has been a blessing to you today. I pray for you. I uh, look forward to seeing you and being with you once again. Look forward to going into worship this morning. And I pray my blessings upon you. And I pray blessings that God be upon you. Thanks for joining this morning. God bless.